Was it God who punished the Titans? In Greek mythology, you have multiple generations of gods. There are primordial gods who are more like representations of things like the sky and earth, and it's those primordial gods who spawn the Titans. The Titans are depicted in a form that was human-like in appearance. Titans then gave birth to the Olympians, who are human-like in appearance like their parents. Zeus was a son of the Titan Kronos, who had been eating his own children because he was afraid they would overthrow him. But Zeus was hidden away, and when he grew up, he wasn't happy about Kronos eating his siblings, so he had Kronos vomit them all back up. Zeus became the leader of the Olympians and ultimately led a successful revolt against the Titans in a war called the Titanomaniki. You could find other examples of two opposing factions of gods in ancient mythologies. In Norse mythology, for example, there was the Azir and Vanir, although neither of those were portrayed as the offspring of the other like in Greek mythology. But I'll be focusing on the Greek mythology here because I think it might be referenced in the Bible. I'll start by getting right to the scripture I think it's referencing. It's from the book of 2 Peter. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. At first glance, this might seem like something completely unrelated, but the word that was translated as hell here is actually Tartarus in Greek. You can see that note in the English Standard Version of the Bible, in the New International Version as well. I think Jude also references the same thing, although he doesn't use the word Tartarus like Peter does. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept an eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Jude, verses 5-7 through seven. In this case, the angels Peter and Jude are referring to that God did not spare are the fallen angels from Genesis 6. In Genesis, they are referred to as the sons of God. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 There are people who have long debated who the sons of God are in Genesis 6. Some claim they are the descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men are the descendants of Cain. And although there are some respectable people who hold this opinion of the text, that isn't what is being said here. These sons of God are angelic beings who left their rightful dwelling place in heaven to sin with the daughters of men. Earlier in Genesis, when God is creating the world, he sometimes speaks in plural. This is because the word used in those instances is Elohim, which is kind of like a description of what God is, but it is a plural form of the word. The I am on the end indicates plural. I've researched why this might be, and the scholars with knowledge of ancient Hebrew are all pretty consistent in saying that while it is a plural word, the sentence it is being used in indicates a singular form. And I'm not going to try to explain the Hebrew grammar here, but I liked an example I heard Dr. Michael Heiser use to explain the concept in modern English. He said it was like walking into a room of people and saying, let us get some pizza. In other words, only one person is saying, let's get pizza, but he is saying it to a group of people. This is essentially what is happening in Genesis when God is saying, let us make man in our image. Not that he's ordering pizza, but that he is speaking to other divine beings that are there with him. This is probably the divine council. You can see this mentioned in Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 
chapter 82, verse 1. This passage alone indicates that God does have his own divine counsel, and I think it is likely the same divine counsel he was speaking to in the beginning of Genesis. It's important to note here that we always have the word gods with a lowercase g. He is holding judgment against them. In verse 6 he says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. Here he specifically refers to these beings as the sons of the Most High, or in other words, sons of God. I think he is specifically referring to the sons of God in Genesis who left their positions in heaven to be with the daughters of men. This was a sin because they were not created to have mates. Only humans had been designated to have mates. The sons of God in heaven were supposed to be immortal, so they weren't supposed to reproduce. Some may wonder how an angelic being would mate with a human woman, but in Jewish legend, when angels came down to earth, they lost their transcendental bodies and were changed into physical bodies. This should come as no surprise, as angels do appear in human form in other places in the Bible, like the two angels that visited Lot in Sodom. At first, no one knew they weren't human. The difference here is the angels visiting Lot were doing what they were supposed to do and did not sin. The angels in Genesis 6 did not do what they were supposed to do and committed sin by siring children with human women. Because these fallen angels had changed into physical bodies, they were sentenced to die like men. To give a little more context here, I want to point out that originally the word angel meant messenger. So an angel of God was just a way of saying a messenger of God. Over time, the word kind of morphed into a generic catch-all term for any sort of divine being that was lower than God. It already seemed to be used that way by New Testament times. But in early Old Testament times, not all non-human beings would have necessarily been thought of as angels. The seraphim, for instance, are the throne guardians of God. The cherubim directly attend to God. These days, they are classified as angels. But that isn't necessarily what they would have been thought of in the Old Testament. Unless they were delivering a message from God, they wouldn't have been called angels. I think this is important for context because I think this is why in Genesis 6, the beings who left their rightful place in heaven to come to earth and mate with women were called the sons of God instead of just being called angels. They were some kind of heavenly beings, but they weren't here to deliver a message on behalf of God. They came to do their own will. They were beings originally created by God, but not humans, so the distinction was made that they were the sons of God and they married the daughters of men. It's not necessarily clear what class of being they might have been, like seraphim or cherubim or something else, but I think it is clear they were some kind of non-human beings created by God. In the Book of Enoch, a non-canonical book that was popular in the first century, it refers to the falling angels as Grigori, or in English, the Watchers. The Watchers taught men cosmetics, building weapons, astrology, and writing. Although not a directly comparable story, this reminds me of the Greek myth of Prometheus stealing fire from the Olympians and giving it to man. Prometheus himself was a titan, and he was punished by Zeus by being chained to a rock and having an eagle eat his liver that would regenerate each day. Although I'm not sure why teaching men to write would be a bad thing. I can understand why teaching men to build weapons would be a bad thing. But to me, the similarity here in the Greek myth, you had the current leader of the gods punishing another god for teaching men something he wasn't supposed to teach them by chaining him to a rock. At the end of the war between the Olympians and the Titans, the Olympians imprisoned the Titans in Tartarus. In the biblical tradition, with some additional reference from Enoch, God punished those sons of God who taught men things they weren't supposed to by chaining them in Tartarus. With the passage from Second Peter in mind, I've wondered how he and others of his time might have viewed the titans of Greek mythology. By mentioning Tartarus, it seems like he might be associating the fallen angels of his Jewish tradition with the titans of the Greek tradition. In Genesis 6, it says the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men were the Nephilim who are men of renown, and in the Enochian tradition were said to be giants. I've wondered if maybe the sons of God might have been viewed as the Titans and the Nephilim viewed as the Olympians. But in Greek mythology, the Olympians were the offspring of just Titans, not a Titan and a human. 
So with that in mind, it would seem more likely the Nephilim would be more akin to Greek figures like Heracles, who was the offspring of a god and, and a woman. But this might have just been a difference in perspective. Ultimately, it probably isn't even relevant if the falling angels were thought of as titans. It doesn't matter whether or not the Olympians were viewed as Nephilim or not. The Hebrew people were probably familiar with the Greek myths because of their vicinity to them and basically being surrounded by other polytheistic religions similar to Greek mythology. But the Hebrews had their own monotheistic religion, so despite probably being familiar with their neighbor's belief, they were probably far from experts on their neighbor's beliefs. They may have just viewed the stories of Titans and Olympians fighting as one big family feud and didn't know all the details. But I think the line in Genesis 6, referring to the Nephilim as men of renown, is significant because I think it is referring to these fallen angels and their offspring, but describing them as men. People have debated what Moses is trying to say here because he doesn't give much detail about it. Nowadays, people read Genesis 6 almost like it's some kind of sci-fi or fantasy literature with fallen angels and giants. But I don't think that would have been the big revelation to the original Hebrew audience. In the context of their time, the people Moses was writing to would have been familiar with the beliefs of the other cultures around them and their beliefs in multiple gods. It's simpler, though, here, I think, because what Moses is telling them is that these other gods their neighbors are worshiping are just men. They are called mighty men, probably a reference to them being larger in size than the average man of the day, but they weren't gods, they were just men. Their fathers were fallen angels who took on physical bodies like men and then married the daughters of men. So their offspring were just men. Uh, maybe taller than average, but still just men. Moses didn't need to go into great detail for the audience he was writing to at the time. I think his point here is that the neighboring cultures were wasting their time worshiping multiple gods who are really just men instead of the one true supreme god. In Moses' time, he might not have been specifically referring to Greek gods, probably more likely Sumerian, Canaanite, or Egyptian gods. Being that the Israelites were in Egypt or wandering in the desert during Moses' life, they were probably more familiar with Egyptian gods than any other pantheon. And although Canaanite, Sumerian, and Egyptian mythologies have their differences, there are also similarities. Peter and Jude were both writing long after the time of Moses. Their homeland was under Roman control, and Greek was still a language commonly spoken at the time. They may have been familiar with the old Canaanite, Sumerian, or Egyptian gods, but in their time, they were probably more familiar with the Greek and Roman pantheons. This is probably why Peter used the word Tartarus when describing how the fallen angels were punished. So did Peter think the fallen angels were the titans of Greek mythology? Well, I don't know if he thought that or not. He may have been familiar with Greek mythology, but I don't think he was an expert in it. The Greeks believed the Olympians imprisoned the Titans in Tartarus, and Peter is saying God imprisoned the fallen angels in Tartarus. You can maybe draw a parallel there, but it's not the exact same story. Because unlike the Greek myth, where the Olympians punished the Titans, God was not the offspring of the fallen angels. God was above them all. So if they are talking about the same thing, they have very different versions of the story. I think the Bible makes reference to the gods of polytheistic religions very early on in Genesis 6. It's a brief reference, but I think being brief is almost part of the point Moses was trying to make. His point was these gods other people around them were worshipping were not gods at all, and were not important. What was important was to worship the one true God. The event mentioned in Genesis 6 is mentioned a few other times in the Bible, at least once in Psalms and twice in the New Testament, but none of the writers of these books go into any detail. Not a lot of detail, anyways. The non-canonical book of Enoch goes into a lot more detail, but the book of Enoch is not accepted in any biblical canon today, with the possible exception of maybe some Coptic churches. And it was not part of the Jewish canon and was dropped for consideration as being divinely inspired pretty early on in Christian history. Although Jude may be referencing Enoch in his writings, this doesn't mean he thought it was divinely inspired. The book was popular at the time, and it's likely he was just referencing it because its readers would have been familiar with it, much like how a modern preacher may reference a popular fictional story in a sermon. Preacher and his parishioners know the fictional story isn't divinely inspired, 
but it can still be used to illustrate a point. Ultimately, I think the Bible tells us that fallen angels did leave their rightful place in heaven and mate with women, and these beings and their offspring were being worshipped by humans. You can call them what you want, sons of God, fallen angels, or titans. It doesn't really matter. What Moses was really teaching is that the fallen angels and their offspring shouldn't be worshipped. And later, the psalmist Asaph tells us God punished them all with death. By the time Peter and Jude were writing their letters, this all would have already been ancient history, even to them. They might have been familiar with the beliefs of the other cultures around them, but what they were referencing is their own Old Testament Jewish literature. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4-10 through 10. For Peter, it was just one example of several he lists of the wicked being punished that his readers would have been familiar with in the Holy Scriptures. I don't think he was trying to make a comparison between ancient Jewish beliefs and Greek mythology. What he was saying to the reader in that passage was that the wicked were punished, but God could still rescue those who sought his righteousness instead of sin. Those are my thoughts on that. Thanks for listening.